Welcome back from the breakout sessions. Um, I hope you feel refreshed. So for the next session, we're going to have a panel. And we intend to have a match after, so I need us to kick off with our own indoor match. Um, so I'll have um, the other row shout, healthcare is a human right. Then I'll have this side fight, um, shout, fight, fight, fight. No, I'll have, I'll have the middle one say healthcare is a human right, then the sides say fight, fight, fight. So um, maybe I could hear you say it. Healthcare is a human right, fight, fight, fight. 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 Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to invite David Ansel for the, the moderator of the next session. Hi, everybody. My name's David Ansel. I'm a doctor here in Chicago, and I'm a human rights activist. Okay, and I, I always say that because a doctor is what I do, and human rights is why I do it. And as we just start this panel, I, one, I want to remind you that we are having an action immediately after this, and I've called in the rain. <laughs> you may have noticed, not only did I call in the rain, I called in the cold rain. Uh, and there's a reason behind this. Because, as we've heard from uh, Kamara and uh, uh, others today, you know, if we're going to fight racism and fight capitalism and exploitation and we're going to fight sexism, uh, that's a tough fight. So we provided the rain for you today as a prelude for that. And if you can make it through the rain to this rally, we have a couple of TV stations here. The focus of this rally is going to be health care as a human right, uh, single-payer health care, but also a proposal to create health care sanctuary for the undocumented in hospitals across America. <laughs> I'm, as I start off, you know, uh, social medicine has a long history. About 40 years ago, I came for my course in social medicine. I was a uh, young uh, medical student, and there was a place to come in the United States for this course, and I left the green verdant hills of upstate New York with a group of other medical students, and we came to Cook County Hospital in Chicago, uh, where I got my training in uh, uh, healthcare is a human right, social medicine. But for the first time as a young white man uh, coming from an experience that was very different through the eyes uh, and lives of my patients saw the incredible damage that racism did uh, for people's bodies and souls and spirits. And as uh, in that place, as under-resourced as it was, the anger and bitterness of having the skills to actually do things, but the technology and the availability just out of reach. And the comfort that I received from my own patients who knew what it was like to suffer for generations under these conditions. So it's really important, that's my, a little bit of my history, and it's why I'm so optimistic about the fight that's in front of us. Uh, but I wanna be a little historical about Chicago now as we begin and before we go to the panel. So I'm going to play something. Um, and just to pre uh, prelude this, it's just a, about a minute. And nine t my, my parents uh, were immigrants. They came from England. Uh, my mother's family was wiped out in the Holocaust. But, they, uh, but I, the BBC decided to come to Chicago in 1979 to show the Brits what healthcare in America was like by coming to Cook County Hospital. And uh, I, I, I found out about it because my relatives called and said, is David okay? <laughs> I also want to just point out, you know, on our panel here, uh, Dr. Fitzhugh Mullen, uh, who's done amazing things in his life, uh, including the uh, 
the uh, Beyond Flexner, which he's going to talk about, Dr. Linda May, uh, Ray Murray, who is my mentor uh, at Cook County and an amazing uh, leader, former president of the American Public Health Association. Of course, you know Kamara Jones. I told Fitz that when I was in medical school, I read his book, White Coat, Clenched Fist, and that kind of got me through there. Uh, but I'm going to show you now a little bit about history uh, and then a little bit about Chicago and where we are now, and then hear from our panel. I call it murder, real one, final mix. Our hospital is a hospital that other private hospitals dump on. And what that means is any patient that doesn't have money, any patient that's drunk or disorderly, they send to us. Um, they often don't care what kind of shape the patient is in. We have many instances where patients arrive here unstable. Uh, in fact, we have many instances every year where patients arrive here and die because they were transferred inappropriately. What's your view of this practice? I call it murder. If that's not a reason to march in the rain, I don't know what is. Okay, I, the, the point is, we didn't just get here today, and the world that we see didn't just get here today. I put this map up, this is the map of, uh, you've seen this now three times today, but I wanna speak a little bit about this map. This is the map I took to our board, it's the west side of Chicago, uh, and in our community health needs assessment for the first time in my institution's 173 years of contributing to this, puts, uh, put, uh, acknowledge that the causes of this were structural racism and economic deprivation, acts of action. And when you think of the, uh, the Gold Coast down the street from us, 85, think number one in the world, think Japan, and when you think three stops from here, Pulaski Avenue, uh, 69, think Iraq or Bangladesh. And think of that cliff analogy for a second and imagine not people trying to climb up out of that cliff, people being shoved over, their fingers stomped on as they try to come out. So this is, th this, these numbers don't occur naturally. They only occur with forces that do this to people. I just wanna point that out. I also wanna point out that May Day is coming up in a couple of days. And just to remind people, people may not know this, but a few blocks from here on May 4th, 1886, Workers gathered for the eight-hour workday. Think about health. And it was really organized about health of families, health of workers, which is uh, Frederick Engels when he talked about working uh, folks in uh, England and called it murder. Uh, Linda was not saying that for no reason, the historical allusion to that. The workers uh, here were uh, you know, organizing for an eight-hour workday. And of course, uh, there was a, a dynamite and the police fired on the crowd and the organizer of the march now, uh, called the Haymarket Martyrs were actually tried and hung, uh, later pardoned. But the eight hour workday uh, came because people went out and actually had to fight for it. It was never given. Same with child labor and other things. Does anyone know who this is? Ida B. Wells Barnett, who, as a school teacher, uh, sued the, uh, uh, the, local, the train system in Tennessee for having her move. She uh, won the initial suit and lost in the Supreme Court. As a newspaper uh, woman, three of her friends were lynched because they were business people and they were successful. She uh, had her presses burned down, threatened with murder, came to Chicago, and really showed the world uh, about the, the uh, horror, uh, the abomination of lynching of black people, particularly black men, which actually continues to this day. And while uh, she was also a suffragette and she was a founder of the NAACP, Chicago, she lived in Chicago. The, uh, I went too far here. 
uh, Fred Hampton, uh, Black Panther, Black Panthers put on sickle cell clinics and a free, uh, free lunches, not far from here either, because kids were starving. And free lunch programs today, and of course he was murdered uh, in his bed. And this is something uh, Cook County Hospital doctors striking, not for themselves, but for the patients, for things like towels and soap and translators uh, and basic human, uh, human rights. Uh, the guy in the middle, uh, Jack Reba, uh, went to Cook County Jail uh, uh, for violation, violating the back to work order. And uh, this is during Linda's and my day. Uh, we, so the idea that you were health activists and, pub, and, and healthcare was a human right was just part of our daily work. And this was us uh, pushing people over to my current hospital, uh, Rush, because we didn't get paid and we're gonna close down the county hospital. Those, that sort of activism got the new hospital. It wasn't clear that that was going to happen. Uh, this is a, uh, a, a police commander on the south side uh, tortured this uh, man and many others. People ended up on death row, John Burge. The doctor who led the house staff strike was the physician, Jack Reba, who actually said this is torture. And torture going on in Chicago, uh, he, he uh, initiated the events that had these uh, folks ultimately ex uh, exonerated and closed down death row in Illinois. But this is the form, this is human rights work that we have to do. These are uh, folks that uh, came to my door uh, in demonstrations, and, and this is them in front of Northwestern, looking for transplants. And there was a panel today with a transplant recipient. As a result of their demonstrations, we haven't solved the problem, but 130 undocumented people in this city are on transplant lists, 45 have been transplanted, 75% got organs from their own relatives. So the idea that if you, if you come out and you speak up and you do this work, things can change uh, goes without saying. This is George uh, Mariscal, came here at two months and was denied at age 16 the kidney that his mother eventually gave him at age 23 when they uh, had hunger strikes at Loyola University. And he said, healthcare should be a human right, not a privilege. At least give us a chance to fight for our lives with dignity. We're not doing this for ourselves, it's for these patients. Oh, this is 16-year-old. This is how uh, we treat mental health in Chicago. This is Laquan McDonald's autopsy report, 16 uh, holes, 16 bullet wounds, actually in the same street that the life expectancy is 69, covered up by uh, the police, covered up by City Hall, led to uh, uh, Black Lives Matter demonstrations uh, across the, the city, and this is how our medical students uh, and uh, physicians uh, responded as well by having uh, lying down in front of City Hall. So the idea that we as health professionals have to do this work is not an option for us not to be, I would say, activists for human rights. We need to be warriors for human rights. We can just go on and on, but I'm going to end here. You saw Selwyn Rogers here, but you know, Selwyn Rogers didn't get there without fearless leading by the youth a youth group on the south side of Chicago that fearlessly got arrested uh, over and over again, uh, demanding that there be a trauma center, but not just a trauma center, jobs, education, housing. So if you look at their demands, the trauma center was part of it, but not, uh, not all of it. And they had a chance that they did at the end of every march, which we're, we're gonna do before the questions. They did, I believe that we can win. I believe that we will 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 win. You know what? These came to my office at Rush and they were 14 and 15 year olds and their passion and their strength brought tears to your eyes. So I'm gonna end you know, with uh, this guy. So this guy died last year, Quentin Young. And Quentin Young, from the age of 16, became an activist for human rights way before he became a doctor. This is him getting arrested one of his times. He is a mentor for many of us. He's a, one of the uh, thinkers behind single-payer healthcare and the idea that we have. And Quentin's famous lines were, everybody in, nobody out. 
Everybody in, nobody out. Everybody in, nobody out. And if Quentin was here today seeing this audience, he would be leading this march today. And so we're doing this march uh, in Quentin's memory. And I just want to say we are doing this march right afterwards, and I hope you will, uh, will join us. All right. That's not what you came to hear. You came to hear our panelists, and I do want to pose some questions to them. And if there's someone from the audience has a question, raise your hand, and I'll, I'll pick on you. But this is for everybody. Given the state of national global politics with the rise of nationalism, fascism, white supremacism, and xenophobia, probably the worst we've seen in, in uh, decades, what will you say the next steps we should all take to advance the health equity agenda in the US and globally? Like, what are the next actions we should do? What should we be thinking about? Well, the next action is to go on the march immediately after this. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, you're right, we've been here before, unfortunately, um, and uh, the most important thing is to do something. I think people have, in large part, responded in ways we haven't seen in a few decades with the Women's March and the Science March and all the other marches uh, that are getting national attention. Uh, but it's not just marching. It means you have to speak up in your schools and your churches and your community groups, and, and you have to find a way to be active every day. Quentin had another saying, let me see if I can remember it, what have we done today against the forces of reaction? Yes. And so that's, that's what we have to ask ourselves every day. I'd, I'd add to Linda's sage advice that um, the best thing among a, a parcel of terrible things that have come with this last election is an opportunity to organize. And the, uh, the number of issues, the number of causes, the number of of families, people, and nerves, and third rails that this leader and administration are going to hit and have hit are, if, if, if you're an organizer, they're a cornucopia of opportunity. And I think what we're doing here, and frankly, the, the sentiment across the country that um, uh, is real, I mean, this business about all oh, those town halls are cooked up, of course, they, you know, they want to suppress the notion that there is real anger and real frustration and real other ideas. And we're here to say that this is real, this isn't cooked up, but we got to keep cooking it in terms of more people, other people. And just in the medical community, the healthcare community, and the student community, it is palpable. People have said over the years, you know, why aren't students, or how are students compared to when you were a student, which was in 1848? No, <laughs> right, I got the uh, 1964, six, eight. Um, and those, uh, always tricky questions. I think students today, are as activated and probably more so um, because the, ch the, the times they're calling for it. So I'm actually encouraged on that side, even though we're taking a lot of damage and a lot of people are going to hurt, uh, we got to make the most of it. And I think that um, we need the activism and then we need the two-year plan or just before two years. So, so in addition to activism, putting our bodies in the struggle, like making our, ourselves visible, um, we need to reach out to our elected officials at all levels, um, constantly. I mean, last week I reached out to my two Republican senators in Georgia because I was terrified. I said, please rein this man in, let him stop taunting North Korea, right? And then after he taunted North Korea, what, two nights ago, um, I, we have to do that again. And then we need to think about how we're going to run for office at all different kinds of levels. So I think that we have the, the sort of advocacy now and then we need to become the lawmakers in the very near future. And I also think we need to be, um, and I know you, this is being recorded. Okay, whatever. But um, <laughs> <laughs> so there was an Ill illegitimate process just now, I think, in this election, right? And we have to recognize that we had to, so many people say, well, so I know that it was close enough that it appears that the current administration won. I'm not sure if they really won, I just have to say that, but it was that close. But I think that to the extent that they are doing <coughs> illegal things now, we need to hold Congress and everybody accountable for that. We can't just sit back and let the continued illegal stuff that's going on now and the continued 
effort to dismantle our government by putting in leadership in the different departments, people who, want, who don't believe in the missions of their departments and want to dismantle, so in charge of energy, somebody who wanted to do away with the Department of Energy, in charge of EPA, people who, you know, somebody who doesn't believe in climate change, in charge of education, somebody who doesn't believe in public education, you know, in charge, all of this stuff, this is like real stuff going on and, you know, I know that there's one party that holds all of the, you know, the Supreme Court and the Congress, you know, House and the Senate and all of this stuff, but these people have to be accountable too. We can't, they can't just keep sliding and letting this illegal, crazy stuff go on. So I don't know the answer to that. But um, I have a strategy, like if I could pull out pieces, I'd pull out number two first and then uh, <laughs> let number one, then charge number one with all the stuff that could be charged with. Nobody knows what I'm talking about if they see this on the I, I, I have not forgotten that Mr. Prince is the vice president. <laughs> but anyway, I mean, like, we have to really be on it and strategizing. My husband says that he and I have been alive through worse times, you know, so we have. But I'm just like, how many people are going to get hurt? with this, and I think that my daughter, who now lives in London, thinks that we're just self-pacifying or something, you know, like la, 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 this is gonna be all right. The first image was when we saw the image of the newly elected person and President Obama sitting in the same room, and we thought, okay, this is gonna be the peaceful transfer of power and stuff like that, and I think we're just sort of deluding ourselves about how urgent this, issue, this situation is. This is not like okay. I don't have the answer, exact, but I think we have to keep the problem squarely in view. The, this is fascism coming on, the, the um, trying to, to illegitimize the media. I mean, that's what fascism does, right? He's trying, to concentrate, he's trying to start a war so that he can then concentrate power even more. I mean, we're on the verge. And we think, oh, we have all of these things in place. I mean, that doesn't help, I mean, that, we're, this is a real threat that we're facing. I'm going to be quiet because I don't have the answer. Linda has the answer. Linda has the answer. <laughs> you know, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not a good historian. I'm not sure uh, if we, uh, if, how far we are down the road to fascism, but we, we are on the road. I certainly agree with that. I think, I think the key thing to keep in mind is that we have seen worse before. That doesn't mean it can't continue to get worse. Don't, you know, think the historical periods are not exactly the same and they don't exactly go into circles. I think we have to understand that the core of health and well-being is social justice. And you can't guarantee social justice without democracy. So what we're talking about here is clearly a threat I would argue it's not even a threat. It's a, it, we have lost democracy. Uh, it didn't happen just in this one election. I think that's the key thing to remember. It didn't happen just with this one victory in November. It's been happening over time as we allow corporations to have rights and, and as we <clears throat> don't allow people that have, been, that have served their time in jail to vote and as we have voter suppression throughout the country. Um, so this didn't happen accidentally. It was planned carefully by groups of people in power. And we have to be smart about that. And so there is no question in my mind that, uh, that we have a danger of fascism in front of us and that we have to fight that. And it means fighting not only around, quote, social medicine, it means fighting on all fronts, all the time, every day. So I have a question uh, for really for the panel about, you know, today we had uh, really clear speech, clear talking, words being used that we don't hear uh, very often. Uh, it was interesting, Dr. Sowen Rogers as well, and I went up and spoke to him afterwards about sort of the clarity of language. And uh, of course, uh, Dr. Jones and Linda, you've never uh, uh, held back on that account. But what do you say to uh, uh, people who are afraid and self-censor, those in the audience, um, to speak up, whether it's privately or, uh, privately or publicly, about structural racism with their own institutions and organizations, for those who are attempting to find their voice, what do you tell them? I'll start with that. Um, don't do it alone, I would say. I mean, that's like a real advice. 
So, but how do you find your allies? Because you can't just look around the room and automatically know who your allies are. So, a strategy that I've recommended that uses my Gartner's Tale allegory is to take the little four-page Gartner's Tale, two pages front and back, and suggest to your neighbors or your coworkers or whatever, let's, you know, I went to a conference on Saturday, I heard this story, I think it would be interesting for us to talk about it over a lunch or at, you know, some kind of professional development thing. So then you guys talk about it, but what you're doing is you're listening to how your colleagues are talking about it. Then you, through how people are talking about it, identify your allies, and then afterward you go and you say, oh, I really appreciated how you were talking about the Gartner's Tale, and now we have these issues we need to deal with in this setting. You know, let's divide up the work, because the thing you don't want to do is to always be the one raising your hand saying, such and such just happened, or this one just said this, or whatever, and they start discounting you. So you need different people, almost in an unpredictable way, to be standing up and doing that message, and then it will become clear that it's not just you with a chip on your shoulder, or the angry black woman, or whatever it is. Um, but, so, but to identify those allies, one thing that people have told me has worked is to use that little thing, just have a discussion of the gardener's tale, hear how people talk, and then identify them afterward. So that's one very specific strategy. You know, we, we're here at Malcolm X College, and, and one of my favorite uh, quotes from Malcolm, which I take very seriously, is he said, thinking is dangerous. <laughs> and so I, don't, I, don't, I, I think people are not crazy when they're afraid. Uh, but the first thing you have to do is think so that you're able to figure out what's going wrong and why it's going wrong and where you might intervene. Um, and then organizing, that's really what Kamara is talking about. Um, you have to organize on all levels. You can organize among students, you can organize in any kind of institution that you're a member of. Uh, that's hard. People disagree, they, they get tired of each other. But to me, the key thing that deals with one's fear is the certain knowledge, now this is easier for some of us than others, the certain knowledge that you will not survive fascism and oppression, the certain knowledge of that. Um, uh, when I was a teenager, uh, I, I was, before I became politically conscious, uh, my mother would ex try to explain to me, she said, Linda, never walk into the gas chambers willingly. Mm -hmm. and." It's just, if, if Hitler had won, we would have been in gas chambers. Um, so understand that I don't care whether you're a neurosurgeon, I don't care what your income is, I don't care where you live, I don't care whether you have white skin, blonde hair, and blue eyes, you cannot protect yourself or your children or people you love from climate change, fascism, and the chaos and injustice that exists in the world. And because our lives are really tied together, that means we have to struggle together to make sure that social justice becomes the law of the land. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've got an additional take, which is uh, not well worked out, and I actually welcome the opportunity to, to throw it out for discussion. I mean, the last election revealed a divide in the country that I think was larger and more uh, more pronounced than many thought. It certainly uh, it was a surprise to me. I'm not unread, and but um, this sort of black uh, or the, the uh, red blue dis uh, distinction is so profound. And to be sure, the notion of hurting Americans is got some truth to it. I think it's been hyped in some quarters, but the folks out there who are feel dislocated, overlooked, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, it seems to me as progressives, we ought to be concerned about how do we talk about that and to those folks. Uh, the geography is difficult. The racial attitudes are profoundly different, et cetera. So it's not an easy or a natural conversation. But these folks have largely, in my judgment, and I suspect most of our judgments, been schnookered by rich Republicans or a certain clique to align their interests. I mean, it seems inscrutable or impossible, but uh, that has been done successfully. It's not, it's not new, it's been going on for years. But this is an opportunity to try to detach them from the notion that people who are uh, against public spending and are for you know, eliminating the 
a whole variety of taxes that will make rich people richer and make government poorer uh, is a good idea for them. So how do we do that? And that's where I think the discussion is needed. I don't have the answer. I think within the health sphere, there are avenues of conversation. We have medical student organizations across the country and all the states that are red as well as those that are blue. Uh, we tend to be more concentrated in urban areas, and these are more rural areas. But I think as a progressive movement, we ought to think about how to make beachheads in those communities, geographic communities, communities of thought, uh, and try to bring those folks to a better understanding of what it means to be a community and be, have solidarity to support your fellow human beings, which uh, seems to be in short supply there. I also, oh, was there a hand? So I also, um, it's not directly to the question, but. You're not required to answer the question. Yeah, it's a thought that's come to me. That it's a thought that I've had before, and, and it was just triggered. And it's about the role of white progressives in this struggle. And so, the, so I'm going to first say that I do not think that white progressives have a role as allies in this struggle, because this is your struggle. So it's not like you can be an ally, right, and check in and out, you know, like I don't have time today, but I'll come and be your ally when, I, when it's a little more convenient. So, so, <laughs> so this is your struggle, especially when you're talking not just for social justice, but racial justice. Um, and the most effective people to talk to white people, including those white rural people, might be, I don't, know if a, I don't know if a white urban progressive will have any kind of way to connect to white rural people who are on the more conservative side, but you would have a better chance of connecting perhaps than I would, okay? And so the charge is for white folks involved in this struggle to talk to other white folks. And not even think, you know, of course you're going to be in solidarity with other people, with other groups, and you need to get maybe marching orders or, you know, coordination or whatever, like everybody together. But it's not for you to swoop in and try to be running some community meeting in a community of color, and that's how you are part of the struggle. You need to go, and be, go to the community meeting, you know, in the rural areas or at least in your neighborhood. Um, I often mention the incident that we all saw, many of us saw, from June of 2015 in McKinney, Texas, where um, there was a group of young teens who were celebrating a birthday party at a swimming pool, and some of the people in their neighbor, in one of their neighborhoods, and, and then the people who were at the pool objected to them being there, called the police, and the thing we saw was a police officer dragging this young black girl and then sitting on her and we saw young black boys sitting on the curb with their hands handcuffed behind their backs. And I then often ask, how do we know about that? Does anybody know how we know about that? Say it again. White boy. White boy filmed it. I didn't even know that. A white boy filmed it the next day. He was on some interview show saying, it was almost as if I were invisible to the police. He was a friend at the same swimming party right? He saw what was happening to his friends. He could have run home for safety, but instead he recognized his white skin privilege that made him almost invisible to the police. And he stood right up there in the middle of all that and filmed it and put it in. So to our white colleagues who sometimes get uncomfortable even with the notion of white skin privilege, and maybe there, you know, some of you who are like, oh, but I'm was, I'm poor and I was born in Appalachia and don't talk to me about white skin privilege, I have my own struggles. I know we all have our different struggles, but if you are living in this country as white, you have white skin privilege. And so the challenge is not to try to shed it or deny it or anything, your challenge is to use it, right? So I put that out there and especially in this thing, use it with other white people, it will take you, your white skin is gonna take you a lot further in the discussion about racism and other systems of structured inequity and social justice and all than me going and doing a thousand talks. So there's an action that we can all do this next week, right? So uh, thank you for, for that. You know, this speech, I want to, 
I want to uh, stay on this idea of speech and sort of thinking about, uh, and then I want to go spend some time on education because this, is, this today was an educational function in a sense. Uh, I've never been to uh, something like this, never had the opportunity when I was a student to come to this. But the idea of uh, uh, speech we talked about uh, uh, before, and the question is, which we, today there's a lot of encouragement to speak up and name it. You've named it in allegories because it's hard to actually say directly what's happening. It's hard to describe this what's so visible but invisible without actually moving like 10 feet back and drawing pictures, like stick pictures of children's stick pictures. So the, I just want to ask uh, the three of you who've been very outspoken in your work lives, have you, what kind of price have you paid? Have you paid any price? Ooh. And uh, And then for uh, in my own institution, uh, my uh, black friends and Latino friends just say, we can't even talk. We can't even say it here. You know, uh, so just talk about the prices uh, that we have to pay. People need to know about the price they're going to pay for speaking the truth. I can start without getting very specific. I was actually recruited to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention um, to bring racism to our lead public health agency, right? To bring an attention to racism, naming it. For 10 years I worked, we organized, you know, a CDC racism and health work group. We helped develop a six question module on the behavioral risk factor surveillance system. That was not a necessarily easy time, but I kept persisting in the work. We had about 300, 350 people, half at CDC, half outside of CDC who were very active in our uh, CDC racism and health work group, you know, our kind of listserv stuff, and it was all good. Then I moved to a different part of CDC, and the long story short is I was moved to help start a, a CDC office on social determinants of health, but after a year it was decided that wasn't going to happen because the Office of Minority Health had expanded its mission. So okay, so fine. So I'm in this new part of CDC, completely new part of CDC. Nobody knows what we're going to be doing. So I figured, well, let me present my ideas for what we could be doing, right? So I decided to do a, a brown bag lunch. I do a talk similar to what I did today. Most people are very um, happy and inspired and all of that. Two people were terrified by what they heard, by the clarity with which I was addressing these issues. And those two, two people were my division director and my associate director for science, okay? <laughs> right? So, so, so the long story short is they tried to make it impossible. In fact, they told me if I ever thought that I was going to include the Gartner's tale or the cliff analogy in a talk. I could not do that as CDC work. I had to take my annual leave, my vacation time to do it, and had to apply to the ethics office 30 days in advance to get permission to do it as an outside activity. And, they kept on, and it kept on being like this. And finally, I was escaped from the CDC um, by Dr. David Satcher, our 16th Surgeon General, who invited me to come and be a senior fellow with him at the Morehouse School of Medicine. So for the first year, I was on leave from CDC to, on loan from CDC to the Morehouse School of Medicine. The first week of my being at Morehouse School of Medicine, I felt that the deliberate attempt to shorten my life had been interrupted by that move. Amen. It was, a, it was, it was such, a, such an oppression yes. that while I was living through it, I didn't know, I, but I didn't have the, the power to fight it. And in fact, there were administrative people who came to me and said, Kamara, the way that they're treating you is not okay. Even if you're not going to do something on your own behalf, you need to do it for us, for the black women who are going to stay here and who are going to follow behind you. You know what I'm saying? But it was just impossible. And so, so it was imp important that I was escaped out of there. Like some people are stuck and they don't have a, an escape hatch. Right. And so they can, you know, so I did. And, and now here I am and I'm still alive. But they were really trying to kill me in terms of the oppression of that. Linda? Well, I think we have to be uh, very careful and, and thoughtful as we think about this. So, so um, if Brother Malcolm was right, thinking is dangerous, but it's a prerequisite for being free. Yeah. So, you know, so you sort of don't have a choice. One of the actions that I did after the election is um, I took my little, little statue of Harriet Tubman, which had been in my office, uh, which is very junky. She's sort of hidden behind books and stuff. And I moved her to the kitchen. Yes. 
<laughs> the general kitchen. My kitchen where I cook, yeah. With your kitchen. Yeah, my kitchen. Okay. Uh, so that I could see her every day. Uh, because Harriet Tubman had a clear insight that her ability to free slaves depended on their ability to understand that they were slaves. Um, and so what I would say, even though I, I, I think, I don't, I don't want to minimize this, and certainly, you know, I, I, had to, I had to be in exile from Chicago for a while. I and I was that. blacklisted. I mean, I, so yes, if you speak up, you do stand a chance, as, as all people do who speak up, of, of uh, being, uh, they will try to kill your ass, either spiritually or physically. Um, or both. Or both. Uh, but um, certainly as, as health professions, we, we have a certain uh, privilege and cushion that people don't have if they're, if they're working in an auto plant or if they're a janitor in a hotel. So, so you have to have some reality about that. Um, and the other thing is you have to understand that if you are quiet, at the University of Chicago or CDC or wherever the hell, if you're quiet and you're a good Negro, uh, you're still gonna be oppressed. And so you might as well <laughs> speak up. Okay. Amen. Okay, because they're gonna try to kill you whether they do it viciously after you give a talk or whether they do it quietly every day. Uh, it's gonna happen anyway. So I, I actually don't feel uh, I mean, I felt the whip of racism, but I don't feel particularly sad about it because I know that it was just a question of how I was going to get whipped, and I'm glad that I was <laughs> able to find people like you to stand up with and, and fight. Yeah. I, I'd like... We have time for one more question because well, then you've got to get your marching feet on here. Yes. Fitz wanted to answer this. Oh, Fitz, go. <laughs> but, but actually, Fitz, I want you to go, but I also want to talk, when maybe you can follow up at the end, just I, about Beyond Flexner Alliance, about teaching this. So maybe you answer this part, because, and then jump uh, into so the educational. I'll, yeah, I'll put them together, actually. You want to ask, or you want me to just? I want you to just go. <laughs> OK. Um, that's, a, that's a very tricky question for me, and I probably don't have enough distance from myself to be able to answer it fairly. Certainly part of the answer is no, being a kind of radical um, under one name or another for all of my career, uh, it hasn't given me much in the way of problems. But I will say quickly, um, in some years and in some settings, there are enough progressives in medicine and certainly in medical education that there are stepping stones uh, that are fairly comfortable for someone like me, at least there have been. Um, which doesn't mean everywhere is comfortable or everybody likes you, everybody wants to employ you. I spent 23 years in the government, and while I recognize the CDC and the experience uh, that Kamara's had, um, it was relatively easy. I wrote White Coat Clenched Fist while a government employee, hmm. and I actually went on book tours and stuff, and I guess I took leave time when I was on book tours, but now this is uh, late 70s into the 80s. Um, and the kind of repression that exists in government or the kind of tracking that exists today and the political tension really was not there. I mean, this, uh, actually, that was uh, uh, Nixon administration, or no, it was, that was Reagan administration when it was out. Um, so, um, and maybe it, it wasn't uh, radical enough or I wasn't pushing enough buttons. But in any event, in more recent years, I've picked a fairly consistent fight with the leadership of academic medicine, that while cloaking themselves in a lot of good guy clothing, often uh, uh, is a fairly uh, conservative and negative force in some markets. And in terms of healthcare as a whole, um, they are producing a brand of medical practice that is bankrupting the uh, country and isn't very effective as we know. And they take no responsibility for that. Well, that's the market. And yet academic medicine and the 100,000 residents uh, in, in the country, the residencies in the country, are part of that. And I pointed that out. We did a ranking study a few years ago, ranked medical schools on social mission. It kind of flipped. Morehouse came out on the top, Vanderbilt came out on the bottom, and most of the brand name schools were in the bottom quartile. They have not forgiven me for that. And I've felt pinches and stings from that, uh, although I remain an academic health center. 
although the dean doesn't in particularly chummy with me, I note. <laughs> now, as part of that effort to kind of um, uh, uh, move in on uh, academic medicine and try to develop another front, uh, I've been part of developing this Beyond Flexner movement, which many of you know about, but just very quickly, following that article, uh, we held a conference in 2012, um, uh, was the first, uh, and about 200 people showed up, academics, students, uh, policy types, to talk about social mission was the term we kind of clustered around in, it was at that point, medical education. We've had two more conferences, uh, the last one at FIU in, in uh, last uh, September. Kamara keynoted our second conference, was terrific, did what she always does, gets real fire in the room. Uh, but there have been great conferences with uh, a lot of uh, fire going out of the room around this question of enhancing social mission, moving the schools. Uh, the concept now is a little bit, everybody says, we do education, we do research, we do service, we do social mission ought to be the fourth competency that all health profession schools do because they, have their, they select the health professionals. They say, oh, well, it's just, you know, they just pass through us. You don't. Know, they pick docs, nurses, whoever. It's the missions committees that determines who's going to be the workforce of the country. Mm -hmm. They have them under their roof for at least four <clears throat> years in medicine, longer in some, shorter in other professions, and they have a great opportunity to mark, walk the walk, show values, uh, and promote a more, uh, a, pl a more effective and a, a more democratic form of, uh, of health care or inclusive. And all said, it doesn't work terribly well. So there's a lot to be talked about there. So that has, as I suggested at the beginning, um, caused, uh, I think, some certainly camps in which I'm not very welcome. But I think that's for a good cause, uh, and I think the, uh, the Flexor movement's progressing. Uh, it has got a whole lot in common with the social med movement, and I think that's very, um, um, to me,